We'll be reading from Nehemiah 4, verses 1 through 6. I don't know if it's proper to call Nehemiah a prophet. Some people call him a prophet. Well, I guess he did hear from God and spoke for God. But he wasn't a prophet in the formal sense of the word. But we're going to look from the book of Nehemiah. Verse 1 says, when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews. And in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall?" Will they offer sacrifices? Will they, find, will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble, burned as they are? Tobiah, the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, What they are building, if even a fox climbed up on it, he would break down their wall of stone. Hear us, O oh our God, is Nehemiah's prayer. For we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. <laughs> yeah, that's a tough prayer. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight. For they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. So, oh bless his name, we rebuilt the wall till all, till all of it reached half its height. For the people worked with all their heart. If you can help me preach a little bit, look at somebody and say, don't let haters stop you. Uh, I'll look at somebody else, tell them, don't let haters stop you. No, tell them, no, nah, for real. And they'll try to, tell them, and they'll try to. Oh, yeah, 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 they'll try to, yeah, yeah. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord and in the company of his people. We are going into a series today. <laughs> <laughs> Call her, I hate her. <laughs> Don't let anything get you off focus. Amen. The message today, <laughs> the message today is <laughs> Don't let haters. <laughs> Don't let haters stop you. Amen. And just, just let me get this on out the way. Some are wondering. Why uh, the panda? Why the panda? Why am I using the panda motif in the marketing for this series? Because I like the picture. <laughs> I just, I just, <laughs> I just, I just, well, I, amen, you know, because I just thought that was perfect. Was like, I hate it. I just, I, <laughs> I just, I just thought it was a perfect. So don't be trying to get deep, you know, just. Well, pandas are the most focused scrutiny. None of that is no Lauren Green. No, no, they just, I just, I just, doesn't it look like he said, I hate her. I just, amen, amen. Don't let haters stop you. So you'll be seeing some panda stuff, and I'm debating on whether I'm, I'm, I'm going to give a panda award at the end. I've been thinking about it because I got a couple of panda things I was going to give out for those. For, if, and I tell you what, if next week, if you have a testimony next week of how you didn't let your haters stop you, we're going to have a panda award for you next year. Amen. So you, if next week you have a testimony about a hater was trying to stop you and you didn't let the haters stop you, amen. Amen. Well, before we do this, we're going to <laughs> look at a little Nehemiah. You are about to meet the Abraham Lincoln or maybe the Martin Luther King Jr., of the Old Testament. 
a respected leader with a tender heart. You will see his tears, perhaps in the Oval Office, as he weeps for people oppressed and vulnerable, or maybe the poignant care as he writes from a Birmingham jail. <clears throat> you are about to meet the, George, the General George Patton, or maybe the Malcolm X, or maybe the Margaret Thatcher of the Old Testament, a rugged leader intolerant of compromise, relentless in demanding perfection, he punished those who were soft by pushing them down and cursing their names and was willing to get the mission done by any means necessary. You are about to meet the Winston Churchill or maybe the Barack Obama of the Old Testament, a statesman tested and tried, resisting the enemies who seek to lure him away from the task, rising above the scuttlebutt and the squabbling factions who could distract him. He is going to bring hope by creating coalitions of willing workers. You will see the tenderness and dogged determination of perhaps Lincoln or King, the fire of Patton or Malcolm X, the, the political savvy of Churchill or Obama, all found in this same man who is called Nehemiah. But there is one thing all of these great men and women had in common. Thatcher and Churchill and Obama and X and King, all of them had this one thing in common. They all had haters. But I'm going to give you a secret on this morning. Here is the secret to having no haters in your life. Y'all want to know what it is? is to never do anything worth anything. <laughs> if you never do anything worth anything, you ain't got to worry about having haters. <clears throat> if you've ever looked at a messy situation and thought someone ought to do something, you'll understand the passion here, Nehemiah, this prophet-adjacent cupbearer felt for Jerusalem. He was in distant Persia, what we call Iran today, under a gentleman whose name was Artaxerxes. Nehemiah heard that the walls of his beloved country lay in rubble, even decades and decades upon decades after the Jews had returned to their generational home. But what could he do? And that's the question many of you have considered uh, when you have been asked to do something big and you've seen something that, what can you do? Maybe in your church or ministry or community, you want to do something to help, but you, you just keep getting discouraged. What could you do? Nehemiah wasn't in full-time ministry. He was in government work. He, was tr he wasn't trained in seminary. He was a business man. He wasn't even local to Jerusalem. He was a thousand miles away across a hot and inhospitable desert. What could he do? He was the king's cupbearer. Uh, now what that means was he had a high position. He was the dude that tasted the wine before and the food actually before the king tasted the wine and food. And this was for several reasons. The first reason was so that the king would not get inferior stuff. If it was supposed to be Moet. I the winos over here. You did. I drink to that. Yeah, just, <laughs> well, it was supposed to be Crystal. All right. <laughs> But instead, it ended up being Morgan David. Oh, Y'all don't know nothing about that Mad Dog 2020. <laughs> it was Ripple. The king wasn't going to have that, and so that would get sent back. Yeah, uh huh. Uh huh. It was supposed to be Fat Burger. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the second was that if someone was, tr was trying to 
assassinate the king through poison. The cupbearer would protect the king by drinking the poison first. In the same way that the secret service would jump in front of a bullet for the president of the United States today. So this was a high and lofty position. He had a good life. But he got discouraged because his brother Hanani sent him a missive and said, the walls, the walls are in rubble and, and the gates are burned down. Now, for those of us who live in our kind of society, we don't really understand societies which are run by honor and shame. But honor and shame, you, it was a shame, it was a reproach for the walls to be down because walls were important to these ancient Near Eastern cities. The walls were protection, but they were also status. The walls said we are a true, real city. Not just some town with one, are y'all following this? One stop sign. The walls, let me, some of you will understand this better. If you've ever lived deep, 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 deep in the hood, where you couldn't afford a fence around your house, uh huh, and, and any time the helicopter, y'all don't understand it. At night when the helicopter come by, and, and first, 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 but before you hear the helicopter in your back, y'all hear, because those running. Or if you have a neighbor next to you that's nasty, y'all don't understand, see? And they got roaches and rats. And if you don't have some kind of, oh, y'all don't understand. If you don't have some kind of barrier between you and them, you also will have, are y'all following this? See, walls were important as they are today, but they were more important to them because it was a shame. Have you ever seen, you ever heard of this thing called, uh, uh, I think it's called Hottie Kitty? Uh, it's called something else too it's in Japanese. Uh, it, Hottie Kitty. <laughs> Harry Carey was a person. It's hotty cotty. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Where, where if they were shamed, instead of living in shame, they would give themselves two deep cuts. One this way, then one this way to make sure you couldn't save them because they would rather die than live in shame. See, ancient Near Eastern countries live on the honor and shame, a system. It used to be like that when we were kids, some of us. If we said, you have my word, that's my honor. Well, the walls are down. And so, so, so Nehemiah is now discouraged. What God requires in his service is a humble heart and courage to do God's work, God's way. When God wants to use you, it doesn't matter of your great station. It doesn't matter that you are the king's cupbearer. It doesn't matter how much money you are making. It doesn't matter how, how you, could, you were always in the best of the best because you couldn't stand next to the king looking raggedy. It didn't matter that almost any woman who was there wanted you. It didn't matter that you were drinking the finest wines and faring sumptuously at the king's table. It didn't matter. All that matters for a servant of God is if God calls, I will leave my place of honor to live in a place of shame. One of the many lessons we can learn from our study of Nehemiah, though, is that when you try to do something about it, even for the right reasons, there are always haters. A hater is someone that is jealous and envious and spends much of their time trying to make you look small so they can look tall. When you make your move to fulfill God's will, you will always attract some haters. That's why you have to be careful whom you share your blessings with. Everybody don't need to know what you got. That's why you got to be careful sharing your vision with certain folks. Because some folks can't walk in your vision, and they just going to try to kill God's vision for your life. Say amen when you can. 
you got to be careful because some folk can't handle you being blessed. All they can handle is you being in rubble and ruin. They, they know that person, but when you start to level up a little bit, they, they can't deal with that. You've got to learn who you can and cannot share God's vision for your life with. But how do you handle your haters so that you won't be a, abort your blessings? How do you handle haters so that you won't be able to miss out on what God has for you? How do you handle your haters so that you don't miss the opportunities that have been scheduled and ordained for your life? How do you walk courageously in your calling when internal haters, that's folk in your own church or in your own house, external haters, folk that ain't got nothing to do with you but just hate you because they haters, and even self-hate, you know, that's when you look at yourself. Oh, come on, somebody. You start knocking yourself even though God has made you great. Talk about God won't let me be great. The next, time, the next time you start putting yourself down, you walk to your bathroom and look in the mirror and slap yourself. What's wrong with you? We're going to find this as we study haters in this book of Nehemiah. One of the major landmines to seeing your vision is being fulfilled is handling haters. Because if you can't handle haters, you won't be able to go where God wants you to go. You will stop. You won't do ministry. You will stop and try to live in their lane. Uh, you, 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 you'll let them tell you what to do and what you can and what you, uh, yeah, yeah. You, you, but you got to learn to deal with your haters. Because if you don't learn to deal with haters, they will run your life. Amen. So this sermon is going to explore hateration. <laughs> Folks are sipping on that haterade. <laughs> Don't need no hateration. Holleration. <laughs> Don't hate on me, haters. <laughs> We have been working together as a church to, to try to have focus 2020. The vision that God has for our lives and for our church. For Nehemiah, it was represented by a wall to be built around the city of Jerusalem. And hopefully through this series, we'll be able to start to understand the power of focused living. Nehemiah, in the book of Nehemiah, is proof that God desires to help us. Even when we are depressed and discouraged. When the enemy seems to have taken control of every, uh, come on, y'all, of every part of your life. In the case of Nehemiah, he went before the Lord with fasting and praying for the nation of Israel. And I have been for the last, for the last four weeks, and I know you don't know, and I've, I've been talking to, to the staff about it. Now. I've been in a dark place. Uh, and I've been doing a lot of fasting and praying. And those of you who have kind of followed me on Facebook, I've been fasting for Facebook. I, I put some on it every now and then just... I've been fasting. I've been fasting from food. I've been fasting and praying. The heaviness of God has just been all over me. And I've, I've been in a dark, dark place. And a lot of it I've been fasting and praying for y'all, for revival, for restoration. Um, some of y'all need to repent. Uh, I've been praying and, and, and asking God to help me and help me learn and And today is one of the best days I've had in four or five weeks. Praise the Lord. And so what Nehemiah does in his depression, he approaches the king. Now, when he's standing there, because when you're the president of the king, you ain't, you ain't supposed to walk up in there looking sad. You better put, see, y'all didn't grow up like me don't understand that. Y'all live in the quote-unquote real world. You know, it just keeps it real. Y'all just, I look like I look. Well, when I was growing up, my mama and my daddy would say, fix your, not your, fix your face. You stick that lip out, you're going to get popped in it. And you be. <laughs> and so if, when you came into the presence of the king, you fixed your face. Are y'all following me? You, you didn't walk in there any old kind of way. But he was so depressed. The king said, what's wrong with you, boy? And he said, my people. 
Let me tell you something about leadership. Leadership for God's people is driven by love. It ain't driven by stuff. Stuff is important. We got a whole lot of stuff. We do a whole lot of stuff here. People do stuff at churches. These churches do stuff. But the, what do they do? You know, amen. We need to do stuff. But, but that's not what drives leadership. What drives leadership is, is loving people. And, and if you don't love the people, you can't lead them. Say amen when you can. So, 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 so here he is risking his life because he can't get his face together. And so Le Nehemiah says, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city of Judah so I can rebuild it. The king said, okay, because he'd been good. This is an aside from the message to let you know how to handle your haters, actually, though. Whatever job you got, do it great. Because you don't know what God is positioning you to do later. Whatever job you got, do it great. Whatever relationship you're in, be a great whatever that is. If it's a father, if it's a mother, if it's a husband, if it's what You don't know where God is positioning you. See, folks wonder about, well, what if I'm a good dad and, 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 and I don't do right by my kids and, and it just don't turn out right? Don't worry about it. 20 years from now, when they're grown, they'll remember that you got on them for a purpose. And now you're repositioned. You're repositioned because you walked in position. Are y'all following this? And since he was good at his job, the king said, whatever you want, let me give you a letter. Whatever you need, just show it to him. You need wood, you need stone. Whatever you need, you need safe passage, just show him this letter. And the king asked him one question, but when are you coming back? Nehemiah didn't give him an answer, though. I'll be back when I'm finished. Now, how many of you got a job like that? <laughs> you walk up to your boss and say, uh, I, I need a raise. I need about 10 months advance. And he said, he said oh, okay, you're a good worker. Um, uh, you have been doing a great job. When you coming back? Uh, I'll be back when I get back. Okay, you got your job when you get back. That's called favor. That's called the favor of God. When you walk in God's purpose, you have the favor of God over your life. And I want you to notice, Nehemiah is still depressed. Nehemiah is still discouraged. Because depression and discouragement, I don't want to get too far afield, but depression and discouragement don't determine the favor of God. Depression and discouragement don't, doesn't even determine whether or not you are in or out of the favor of God. See what God is blessing in your life. See where God is giving you favor in purpose. Don't worry about how you're feeling. How you feel is going to change up and down. What you've got to do is walk in, amen, amen. Hey, I don't want to get too far ahead. So he goes to the people. He gets there to Judah and Jerusalem, and he, he goes and he says, he says, uh, well, first, 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 first thing he does, is he gets a horse, and he rides around. He is assessing the situation. He doesn't tell anybody what he's doing or his vision. Can I help you just a little bit? And I'm going to talk directly to my friend right here for a minute. He's sitting over there with that pretty girl. He know who he is. I'm looking this way so he, won't, so he won't know I'm busting him out, but he know I'm busting him out. I've told him before, he's a leader. He got to be willing to pay for his leadership, though. He's got to be willing to walk in his amazing gifts and put in the work to be who God wants him to be. And I'm telling y'all the same thing. And everybody can't own your vision. When God gives you something, you got to own it. And you can't be mad when other folk don't own it. Hey, Jesus. See, that's the reason I'm not looking at him on purpose. <laughs> Look this way. Because when God moves in your life and he's expecting you to do something, he's expecting you to have used the time he gave you to be prepared for when he positions you for purpose. Is anybody in here with me? And so when God wants you to move in purpose and he's prepared you, then you can go tell folks, you know what, there's a hole in the wall. Every time I read this passage, it trips me out. They had been there maybe 40 years. Somebody from a thousand miles away got to come and tell them there's a hole in the wall. They've been walking around all this time in shame 
That's when I explained that whole honor shame thing. This is not just, oh, oh, we got a, you know, the fist in the back need a couple of new. No, this is a shame and a reproach. This is the kind of jacked up fist that you don't want nobody to come to your house with. When somebody says, can I come by and bring you some money? You say, I'll meet you on the corner. I don't want you to see my jacked up fence. Somebody from a thousand miles away had to come and tell you, you know what, your life jacked up. Do you know what, your marriage is jacked up. You know, you're a horrible parent. Look at your jacked up kids. Uh, did, I, did I come to the back door with that? Oh, I'm sorry, my bad. Let me move on. I'm still in the introduction. He goes to the people and and he gives them the vision. And then the people say, ah, oh, God, help me here. The people say, let us rise up and build. The people said it. Can I give you another principle about leadership? Leader's job is to see and to point. The leader's job really ain't to do. The leader's job is to see and to point. See the problem? This is where we need to go. See the problem? This is where we need to go. That's what a leader's supposed to do. The people then are supposed to say, whoa, that is a problem. Let's go. Every great leader knows that. And every great leader is frustrated or either fired up because of it. You can't name a good, you think you said, well, Martin Luther King, well, let me tell you what happened if, if the people wouldn't have decided to raise up. He would have still been this young dude at his daddy's church. He would have been a smart young dude, but that's all he would have been. People talk about people like Barack Obama or even Ronald Reagan and, and who, who, who people say are great leaders. They were great leaders because they pointed to the problem and, and pointed the way to go. And the people got up and said, let's do it. Praise the Lord. The reason we had a president we have now is not because uh, uh, of him doing a great job. I'm not knocking him because he does do some things well. I'm not knocking him. What I'm telling you is the reason he's in there is because people rose up and said, we want this dude. Let's go his way. That's how it works. That's how it works. And I want to drop a little Metro on you. At Metro, we can't go nowhere just because Brother Haygood sees it and says, let's go. If the people don't rise up and say, I'm with it, I'm with it 100, it ain't going to happen. It ain't going to happen. I'm trying not to get ahead of myself. It's just not going to happen. You'll see what I'm talking about in a minute. So the, the leader, he says, let's do it, let's go. And they said, let's ride it up and let us build. So, so let's see. Okay. Let's see what we learn from the backstory. Here's what we can surmise. First of all, sometimes, this is the first part of you. <laughs> I'll be finished before part one. Sometimes people are so used to having cracks and holes that they don't feel comfortable unless you're cracked and full of holes. Once you start to level up, they got a problem with you. As long as you were jacked up like you used to be and tore up from the flow up, they were good with you. But as soon as you start getting better, they got problems with you. But as long as you and your wife are in a bad place, they were cool with you. Things going good, all of a sudden they got problems. Because this is what haters do. Sometimes we've been living in disrepair so long that we don't even notice it anymore. Do we have our witness here? We don't even notice it. My poor bride, bless her heart. She got to walk through my jacked up office to the office. <laughs> and I don't even notice. I just go on to be working. <laughs> Sometimes God's timing and your timing are completely different. I had a preacher speak that into my life this week. I was sharing how much of a dark place I'm in. And he, and he was telling, you know what? God's timing. It's God's timing. It, it, it doesn't matter what you feel about it. It's God's timing. And God, don't, uh, God, God God's not going to change his timing because you're depressed. It's God's timing. Oh, God, yeah, I, I can't stay there. Sometimes God is positioning you in someplace else to have the level of resourcing and skills to bring generational community, community deliverance. God is doing something with you now for what he needs to do with you later. 
And your later might look like a step down, but in the spirit, it's a step up. Jesus. Yeah. Sometimes God calls you to be so focused on his will that you're willing to sacrifice everything so that he can have glory. Sometimes you walk into your boss's office and say, this is my last day because I got ministry to do. Oh, y'all don't know that's me? Sometimes God calling on your life means leap because I said leap. And I guarantee you if you leap because I said leap before you touch the bottom, of, I got you. I will give you a caveat here or a little warning that if God didn't say leap, don't go leaping just because you feel like leaping. And like because you leap, God has some kind of <laughs> responsibility to catch you because you decided to leap. Well, Jesus, you, God will pick you up in the bottom. But <laughs> Well, let's look. Here's what Nehemiah did. This, this is your other sheet. This is your other sheet. What he did was, first box, he recognized and, and admitted there was a problem. See, in dealing with problems, solving problems, first recognize and admit there is a problem. That's what I mind folks telling me it's a problem. Just because I get mad at you don't mean I mind. It, do, it, do, it doesn't. I'm mad because I'm mad. Don't nobody want to be told that you jacked up. But I'm glad you told me. Who your breath stank. Well, I wish you wouldn't have said it like that, but you know what? I'm glad you told me. I've been running around here burning up nose hairs and, you know, contaminating babies. And Thank you for telling me. Walking around here with boot mouth. Breath smell like feet. <laughs> Amen. But if you're not willing to say, you know what, there's a hole in the door, go wall. And you got to admit, well, you know what? There is a hole in the wall. Next, pray about it. Fasting and prayer. Don't just jump into solving, jump into prayer. Next, develop a plan. And you see, that's what Nehemiah does. We walk through Nehemiah, develop a plan. Next, implement the plan. A plan without implementation is just frustration. Did you hear what I said? I said a plan without implementation is just frustration. Can I say that one more time? I said planning to do something and then not implementing the plan is just frustration. Those are the folk you see years later. You know I plan to go to school. Oh, I'm sorry, let me look over here. I didn't mean to get on nobody's street. <laughs> Amen? And then years later, they're frustrated with life being mean to folk because 10 years ago they had a good plan. They never implemented it. Or they started it and stopped it. All right. So let's jump into the text. Nehemiah chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. This first point is in verses 1 through 3. The Bible says, Now when Sambalat heard that we were building the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged, and he jeered at the Jews. I looked at this passage and I thought, why is he mad? And that used to bother me. Some folk would get mad. But I learned that some folk mad are just because they haters. Quit trying to figure out haters. And he said in the presence of his brothers and of the army of Samaria. The reason he could say it because he was a governor and thereby over the army of Samaria. What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish up in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish? And burned? Uh, and, and will they enliven these burned up rocks? What are they going to do here? Because that's what haters do. Haters see you coming up. What you doing with a new car? 
you ain't nobody. I can remember there was one time this brother walked to me back when I was younger and dumber. I was, I was younger and dumber. Because I still like Audis. But I always have a new one. Leasing them though. Just dumb. If y'all leasing now, I'm not calling you dumb. I'm saying it sure was dumb for me though. Paying all that money, $800, $1,000 a month to drive around in, in a new car. Just dumb. I'm so glad I ain't got, y'all don't know, I'm so glad I ain't got no car, no, I don't know what to do. But anyway, you know, I just don't know what to do. And, and, and we need a new car, right, to this day. We need a new car. I'd rather keep fixing it. Everybody told me, you need to get a, I know I do, I don't care. When I start thinking about a car, no. Anyway, I, I digress. But when I was young in number, you know, I had my, my this is when I had, had one, it was, a, it was, it, it looked purple or it looked green or it looked blue. <laughs> Depending on how to light, oh, it was pretty. It was, it was like a, it was like a snakeskin look. It was pretty too far. Oh, I still miss that car. But anyway, I remember this brother walking up to me. You don't need to be driving in that. I'm like, what the Henry Ford? What you mean I don't need to be driving this? Well, you know, you're a preacher, so you know, you need to have some. Word. And it used to, stuff like that used to bother me. Stuff like that used to bother me. Now I understand they're just haters. They just haters trying to discourage me out of my purpose. And so next, Tobiah, in verse number three, he, the Ammonite was beside him and he said, Yes, what they are building, if a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. If you got a fox, <laughs> you and your little rocks, putting your little pebbles up there with your little Play-Doh. If a fox is going to stumble down, you think you're doing something. That ain't no wall. That's an accident waiting to happen. Y'all ain't doing a hater. A hater. Wanted to keep them in shame. I want to show you some things. First of all, Anyone who desires to do a great thing will face haters. You hear what I said? If you're trying to do something good, don't worry. You're going to have some haters. Go ahead and expect them. When you start to do better, expect them. When, let me, <laughs> y'all, she ain't here now, so I'm going to talk about it. This, this morning, uh, 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 Luana came in. She, she had did up her hair. Because you know I be getting on her with a little ponytail all the time. Anyway, so she done pressed her hair and she walking in, you know. I guarantee you somebody before the day I go hate on her. I guarantee you. Then Camille came walking in today with a new cut. I said, which Camille I got today? Because it's going to be a different Camille next week. I guarantee you. <laughs> when you. Once you do something, anything. Somebody going to hate on it. Am I right about it? Somebody's on Facebook right now looking at Cedric's profile. What are you doing on the little show? He ain't nobody. That ought to be me. Whenever you try to do anything, you're going to face hell haters. You must prayerfully discern whether a person is a harsh hater or, or helpfully pointing out your issues. I just want to say that. Because everybody tell you something, they don't mean they hate you. See, some, some people are Sambalat, Tobiah, and Geshem. Some people in your life are Nehemiah. Some people are just hating. Some people are saying, yo, it's a hole in your life. They're not hating, they're helping. The presence of haters in life doesn't necessarily mean that God opposes your dream. And I, I, I struggle with that. See, that's for me. Because I, I got a nation of haters. Those that know me know I'm not bragging. That's not, even, that's not a humble brag. That's just the truth. I got literally people across the nation who just love to hate on me. Love to do it. It used to bother me. I'm like, dude. We average here about 140. Today, we have about 105, 110. We got a lot of folk out today. But we average about 140. Why hate on me? 
Now, if I had 1,400, you could hate because I probably would be full of myself. <laughs> How many do you have? What is your attendance? <laughs> oh, don't let me get the 14,000. Oh, y'all ain't even going to talk to me. I, I'm going to come up from the bottom of the pulpit. <laughs> the smoke machine don't start. <laughs> but why hate now? I'm struggling just like you. We're all struggling. We're all fighting this fight. So you should bother me, but I, but I learned that that doesn't mean God is opposing my dreams. That just means the enemy got folk hating. Haters will criticize and oppose your dreams, vision, or project because they're jealous. Just because they're jealous. It's not, it's not about you, it's about them. Discouragement sets in when there's a gap between what you expect and what you get. Anybody ever been to a, a steakhouse and got the wrong steak? Now, for those of you who, who, who like me, who, who, who don't mind paying, you know, $70 for a good steak, I can't do that but once or twice a year. Amen. I ain't cray-cray. But I don't mind, you know, going like, yes. And, you know, you, you <laughs> good steak, <laughs> y'all don't understand. A, <laughs> when you go to the real expensive ones, they give you the knife. They only had no ridges on it. It looked like a butter knife. <laughs> and you cut it like this. Come on. Woo! Woo! But when, you, when, that, when that $70 steak come out and you ask, I want a medium, not medium rare, not medium well, medium. And when it comes out and it looks like it's been floating on the river sticks in the heart of hell, it's burnt, look like a hockey puck, you got a problem. But that's when discouragement sets in in your life, too. When you expected God do, to do something and you get different than your expectations, you can get discouraged. What I want to tell you to do is hold on. God is wiser than you. He's controlling this thing. Don't worry about the numbers. The numbers started getting goofy. Just stay with it. For some reason, the PowerPoint started just repeating this six number. Discouragement can destroy passion and undermine your purpose. If you are facing haters in your goals, then you're most likely on the right track. If people are hating on you, you're probably on the right track. Discouragement erases, reduces, or diminishes your courage. I'm gonna give you a trick. If you're feeling discouraged, get your butt up. That's right, get your butt up. That's right, I said it. Don't lay up in the bed feeling all down in the, oh, the world is bad. Honey, get up, get your hair did and your nails and your feet did. Put on your cute little black dress and your black pump and walk on out here. That's right, that's right. Don't be laying up in the bed like, oh, woe is me. Get on up. Go on, get cute. That's right, that's right. If, ain't no need of looking bad and feeling bad. Hey Amen. Get on up. That's right, homeboy. That's right. Go on down to your favorite barber shop and get cut up. That's right. That's right. Come out looking good. Go to your favorite restaurant. Hey Amen. If you're going to cry and eat, you might as well cry and eat the best thing you can eat. Don't, don't let stuff get you down. Amen. Amen. Pray about it and move on. Hallelujah. Haters are meant to serve as triggers to God's purpose in your life. Haters will irritate you to the point where you'll move. Because sometimes you won't move until somebody starts hating. Amen. Haters will, are meant to serve as triggers to God's purpose in your life. There must be an expectation for there to be disappointment. The reason that's important, because I'm trying to let you know, the reason you're disappointed is because you're trying to do something. If you weren't trying to do something, you wouldn't be discouraged. Because you ain't trying to do nothing anyway. 
But when you're trying to do something, it's because you have certain expectations. Discouragement is contagious, but so is passion and encouragement. Are y'all feeling me? Have you ever been around folks that just always just, you walking in, they like, you ever seen that? I'm going to give you a trick. The next time you walk into one of those cackles of discouragement, here's what I want you to do. Walk in there and say, good morning to you. How are you doing today? And when they say, oh, I don't even let them finish them. God is good. And amen. If they're, if they're Christians, make them be heretics. Ain't God good today? <laughs> Dare them to say no. Ain't the Lord amazing? Didn't God wake you up this morning? I'm so happy that God decided to wake me up and that I'm walking on time side of life. I stand at six feet, but I could be six feet under. Because <laughs> your encouragement is also just as contagious. Folks will say, that's being fake. No, no, you decide how you're going to look at that. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. You don't have to act like you feel all the time because you don't. Amen. Okay, let me give you a little test. Has anybody been joyously happy? I mean, jumping for joy happy. Did you jump for joy with your fake self? See that? Oh, see how that works? Uh huh. I don't know how many times I've been preaching, and the person said, You know what, preaching, it was so good. I just want to jump up and shout glory to God. I'll be like, Why are you so fake then? If that's how you felt. So if your feelings don't determine your demeanor, you decide. You decide. Well, that's some good old preaching. Some of y'all looking at me like you want to cuss me out. Go ahead and keep it real. Cuss me out. I got, enough, I got as much scripture as cuss words you got. And I'd rather stand before God with my scripture than with your cuss words. So come on with it. All y'all Presbyterian Baptists. <laughs> you Catholic Methodist looking. <laughs> let, us, let us hurry. Holy people deliver haters over to God. Hear what the Bible says in verses 4 and, four and 5. Nehemiah praying says, Hear, O our God, for we are despised. Turn back their taunts on their own head and give them up to be plundered in a land where they are captives. Do not cover their guilt and let their sin, and let not their sin be blotted out from your sight. For they have provoked you to anger in the presence of the builders. Let me, I want to unpack that a little bit. I want to have a definition for you. I'm not going to read it all. It's, on your, it's in your notes. But this was called an imprecatory prayer. To imprecate means to cast, to call down curses or evil on someone. And that was his prayer. Now, now, let, let, me, let, me, let me help you understand, good Christian. You have to understand the heart before you can give an imprecatory prayer. Because if your heart isn't given over to God, see, imprecatory prayers are never about, are about offense to oneself. Imprecatory prayers are about offense toward God. And when you're walking in God's place and in God's purpose, then you understand how to give an imprecatory prayer. But if you foul your dog on self, you don't have any need to imprecate anyone lest you find yourself imprecate yourself. Do you feel me? See, imprecatory prayers always return back to God. Just like laments do. Remember Psalm 13, uh, the, the lament of David. He, he said, Lord, uh, how long, how long, how long, how long? But he always returns to, but I will praise you. In other words, I'm in my feelings, but I ain't tripping. See, it's all right to be in your feelings. It's just not all right to be in your feelings and tripping. See, when you don't know God, you start to feel like your feelings are God. You start to worship and praise your emotions. Uh huh. So instead of you praising the Lord, you are praising your emotions. No, 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 no. You being angry is all right, but don't start tripping. God, I'm mad. Yeah, God, I'm mad. I'm, I'm mad at you, God, but I ain't tripping. 
Are y'all following me? So, so, so let, let's, let's look at this passage just very quickly, verse number four. First he says, hear, O, God, o our God. This idea of hear, it means God listen to me and do what I ask. It's not an order. It's a request. Lord, listen to what I'm saying and do what I'm asking you to do. O Elohim, O self-existent one, listen to what I'm saying and do what I'm asking you to do. He says, here's why. Because they're shaming me. Remember, that's an honor-shame society. They're shaming me, God. It's one of the worst things you could have done to them. They're shaming me. Listen to me. It's like a, it's like a, a supplicant going, coming before a king and saying, oh, king, hear your servant. There are bandits in my land. They're killing my sheep. And they're raping my children. Get them off my land. He, he, doesn't want the, he doesn't, just doesn't want the king to hear what he's, what's coming out of his mouth. He wants the king to respond in action. And that's your prayer. So don't ask God for something you don't want him to do. Amen. Amen. Lord, send me a man. Lord, send me a woman. Lord, give me a job. And when he give you a man or give you a woman or give you a job, you don't want the man, woman, a job he give you. Because God's timing ain't your timing. Oh, that's good preaching. Oh, God, anyway. anyway so so that's, that's the first part. And the second part, I just want you to hear what he said to him. Verse number four. He says, turn back their hate, their taunt on their own heads. What they're saying to me, bounce it back on them. And give them to be plundered in a land where they are captive. Let somebody come and destroy their land and put them in a place where they have no wall. Do not cover their, now here's the worst part. Do not cover their guilt. And let not their sin be blotted out from your sight. God, don't give them the atonement. And God, don't forgive them. That's his imprecation. He ain't playing with them. Then I want you to hear what he says. The Bible says, here's why. Because they have provoked you to anger. See, it ain't about me, God. I'm praying this because they shame me. But it's really about you. Because they can't talk about somebody trying to do your will and not make you angry. That's why you need to be careful. Amen. Be careful talking about Christians. Be careful. Be careful talking about folks walking in God. Be careful. Be careful because you'll end up with the anger of God pointed toward you. So that's what holy folks do. They hand it over to God. Now we move to the last point. Hard work keeps people on purpose. <laughs> hard work. Can somebody say hard work? <laughs> somebody say hard work. Okay, let me give you another. <laughs> Tell them <laughs> laziness frustrates purpose. Touch your name and tell them laziness frustrates purpose. Oh, oh y'all didn't hear me. Okay, let me help you out. Look at somebody and tell them. The reason you ain't walking in purpose <laughs> is because you lazy. <laughs> you say, why are you saying that, preacher? I'm saying because what we usually say is, I don't have enough money, or I don't have enough talent, or I don't have enough skill. Or, that is never the case. God always provides. God, hey, can somebody holler, holler hallelujah. God has, God has already given you everything you need. Did you hear what I said? Everything, everything Metro need, God already gave it. Everything. Everything. Everything you need for your child, God already gave you. Everything. Wait a minute, we was on the same page a second ago. Now y'all back to cussing me out again. Wait, what's up? What's up? Y'all mad again? Come on with it. I, got, I still got scriptures. <laughs> Laziness will mess you up, boy. He says in verse number six, our final six, he says, so we built the wall. Y'all missed it. He said, we prayed, then we built the wall. We wait. <laughs> we just started building. I said my peace to God. Now I'm back on purpose. So we built the wall. And then the Bible says, I want you to hear this. 
<laughs> and the wall was joined together to half its height. Learn to celebrate little stuff. I know we live in one of those societies. Well, if you didn't win, why are you celebrating? I was on the court. I had a jersey. You ain't had no jersey. I got my little sweat on. So he said, yeah, yeah, we ain't finished, but I'm praising him because I'm halfway there. Do I have any halfway there folks today? Do I have any folks who own their way? They ain't there yet, but they know they ain't where they were. Oh, God, do I have any halfway folk there? Well, I, yeah, I ain't overcome yet, but I'm halfway there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not quite all right, but I'm halfway there. Yeah, my money ain't really right, but I'm halfway there. Do I have any halfway there, folk? And then he says, for the people had a heart to work. Most of the versions say a mind, but the Hebrew literally says, for the people had a heart to work. See, the heart for the Hebrew, it was inclusive of the mind, but it, it included the core emotional content of a person. They were saying, because of what I know, I'm pumped up about doing this. I'm about to be about it, about it. <laughs> about it, about it. So let me conclude. Let me show you some things. Don't wait for your prayers to be answered before you walk in purpose. That ain't how God works. God says, you pray, and then you start walking. <laughs> what you want from God, ask him, then start walking. See, see, we want it the other way. God bless me and I'll start walking. God says, start walking and I'll bless you. <laughs> yeah, so, so see, before, before the, he prayed and he said, so we built the wall. We didn't wait till he dealt with Sambalat and Tobiah. We just started building. No, God, because I ain't glory to God. I'm that person too. God, if you would just, God, just come on, just, God, if you would just, God, come on and just, and God is saying, boy, get up, brush your teeth, good Lord, and go, do, amen, and go do what you're supposed to be doing. You can't wait on me. If you ask me, I got you. Don't be fronting like I'm some absentee daddy. I'm your daddy. Everything you need, I got you. Once you pray, start to be about what you're supposed to be about. Next, an unrepaired wall is a reproach. Don't be in denial. If your wall ain't right, understand you are in shame. And I know you might be used to your shame, but don't be so lazy that you ain't willing to fix it because discouragement make you lazy too. Oh, come on, I'm telling you what I know. I had one day, y'all didn't know me, no. No, I'd be putting in 20s. One day this week, I did nothing. I just feeling bad. At my own little pity party, I ain't inviting now one of y'all. Woe is me, me is woe. Fool! <laughs> Get up! Brush your teeth! My poor bride, she's so wonderful. But she like, dude. Mm-mm. 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 <laughs> Understanding of how bad a thing is causes a response toward healing. The reason many of us don't get healed is because we don't know how bad it is. So we never move on it. We don't know how bad it is. You go to a counselor sometime and they start to talk to you. And it's hard to freak you out because you didn't know how bad it was. Oh, my God. And glory to God, that's the reason some of y'all don't go to the counselor because y'all love denial more than you love healing. Oh, God, that's a word for somebody. We love denial more than we love healing. We'd rather walk around in our denial than get healed from our mess. We'd rather stay in our mess, rubble, burnt down gates, then get healing. Can't stay there, but y'all got the point. Ain't you? So the Bible says they repaired the wall. Don't just talk about it, be about it. I've challenged many of our members and challenged myself. God has blessed you to do some things. Quit running your mouth. Let's be about it. 
Amen. Let's be about it. Let's get it done. Because God is worthy. Hey, Nani has already called you. He's already told you there's a hole in the wall. And he's hoping that once you see that there's really a hole, it'll move your heart. If you have a heart for God, that you don't want God's, God's family to be in reproach. There's a hole in the wall. Don't talk about it. Be about it. Remember, halfway is better than no way. Have our witness here. Anybody ever been no way? Anybody had 10 bills and couldn't pay one? <laughs> Ain't it good when you can pay, even though you still got 10, you can pay five now? <laughs> halfway is better than no way. I'm telling you what I know. Halfway is better than no way. Great things happen when the people have a heart to work. And finally, it's not about how bad you want it. I stole this from somebody. It's my design, but I stole it. I don't mind giving credit. Yeah, you know, I be stealing stuff all the time. Folks steal from me. Rick Warren said, the first time you use my stuff, say I heard Rick Warren say it. He said, the second time, say Rick say it. <laughs> he said, the third time, say I heard somewhere. He said the fourth time, say, I was thinking the other day. <laughs> so I stole this from somebody. This is the first time. <laughs> it's about how hard you're willing to work for it. it it's not about how, how, how much bad you want it. I mean, I believe there's a lot of folk in here that really want it bad. They want it bad. Some of you can't sleep because you want it so bad. You want to be better for God. You want God to bless your business. You, you want it so bad, you, you can't hardly sleep right. But it's not about how bad you want it. It's about how hard you're willing to work. There's a saying that's going around, I found it to be true. That hard work will be talent every day. I gave a couple of examples this morning. I'll try to give you a couple of them right quick. There's two people I know. One of them is Jesse Mara. He's a legend in the church. He's a good singer. He's not a great singer. But he is a singing legend because of the kind of work he puts in. Now, his brother, Jeff coming up, sings circles around him. But, but you know, Jesse is the legend. Now, no wrong with Jeff. Ain't no slouch. Oh, no, he ain't no slouch. But when you talk about a legend, Kentucky Fried Gospel, <laughs> that's, let me give you another one. A gentleman named Keith Lancaster. Keith sang all right. But I grew up around singers. He ain't close to the good singers I know. If, if I put the, the, top, the bottom 10 good singers I know on the stage and put Keith up there, all 10 of them, would sing around, sing, just circles around it. But guess what none of them have? A Grammy. <laughs> Keith Lancaster has a Grammy. Are y'all following me? Because of hard work. Everybody wants it bad. Everybody wants a better marriage really bad. I really want it so bad. Everybody wants a better job. I want it so bad. Everybody wants the church to grow. I want it so bad. But if you're not willing to put in hard work, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I'm here to tell you today if I can give you a word of encouragement. Take your level of, of, of wanting it bad and, and translate it. Translate it into, uh, 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 into hard work. I want to give you one final example. Different than I gave this morning. I have a friend. His name is Al Wilson. He's an elder in the Bay at the McDonald Avenue Church of Christ. Great singer. When we all came up together preaching, he didn't want to be no preacher. I was a talent guy. I don't mind saying that. That's what I was. I was a guy that everybody said, ooh, ooh. We all went to school together. Me and David and a couple of other were the smart guys too. Now, none of us were as smart as David. We all, we're the smart guys. Alvin, trying hard to remember Greek, you know, just the alphabet. No, I mean, for real, he's struggling. Guess what Alvin did? He outworked us. 
Is he a better preacher than us? They probably not. He makes way more money than us. No, no, you don't understand. Alan makes three, four times as much money as we do. The guy who, who nobody thought was the most talented guy, as far as preaching and, and, and academics, who never thought was a genius, no, no, no. He got a couple of houses. I'm still trying to pay off the one I got. Do you hear what I'm telling you? It's not about talent. It's about hard work. See, if you want to deal with your haters, don't put, don't put your energy into your haters. Put your energy, the energy you were going to put into your haters, so we built a wall. Pray about them, get about it. Amen. Don't let haters get you off focus. Pray about it, be about it. Amen. Amen. I, I'll give you one more, one, one final one. Young lady uh, who grew up, um, she's an amazing singer, don't get me wrong. So I don't want to cast a purge. Because she's an amazing vocalist. But when she came up, there was a whole lot of amazing vocalists. And that was Brandy. She had a whole lot of competition. She did. It was a whole lot of competition for Brandy back. A whole lot. You talking about somebody put in work? Brandy ain't playing with them. To this day, she's not top 10 artist right now, but she's still putting in work. Oh, you had a lot of things. You remember, yeah, Monica, Aaliyah. You had the whole escape thing. <laughs> you remember, there was a lot of them. Remember, there was a lot of them back in the day. And that's the thing I know. And now, Brandy's being mentioned in the same voice as the Beatles. The Beatles? Word? The Beatles? The little girl who was running around talking about, can I sing with y'all? Now she's being compared to the Beatles. Because she put in work. And I want to encourage you. You say, I'm, I'm feeling discouraged. Don't feel discouraged. What I'm telling you is if they can do it, you can do it too. If God can show you, can give you some discouragement about the holes in your life. Amen. If God can show you the rubble in your life. If God can show you the stuff that's burned down, you can do it too. You can be everything you need to be. Can somebody get a Lord praise? Come out and shout hard work. Come on, stand to your feet. Amen. If you're here today and, and you need God, come on down here. God is great. If you need God, come on down here. If you need salvation today, that's the one thing you ain't got to put in hard work for. Because Christ has already put the work in. What he says, I need you to just, in faith, obey me. Hear my word, believe it. Turn from what you used to do. Amen. Confess. Be baptized in water for the remission of your sins. And God will do amazing. If you're here and you need him, come on right now to sing the song of encouragement. It is so sweet to trust, trust in Jesus, Jesus just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the same. Jesus, oh. oh.